Now, let me ask you a question. Where can you lose blood? I'm going to teach you an acronym, which actually one of my young colleagues like you taught to me. The acronym is CARPET, C-A-R-P-T. This acronym tells where you can lose blood when you don't see it coming out of a patient. Here we go. C, chest. A, abdomen. R, retroperitoneum. P, pelvis. And T, five. Let me repeat that. Chest, abdomen, retroperitoneum, pelvis, five. And that acronym, CARPET, I use it all the time, meaning even at, at my level. When I see a patient in the emergency room and they're in shock and no blood is outside, I think in my head, chest, abdomen, retroperitoneum, pelvis, and fly. And I want you to do it. And even when you write up the patient, say, there's no evidence of whatever, chest, abdomen, retroperitoneum, pelvis, or thigh. All right, so I want you to remember that indeed, those are the places you can lose blood when it's not on the outside. All right. Now a very important test question and life question. If you've got a patient who has a major head injury and they're fixed and dilated, can this cause hypovolemic shock? No, no, there is no space in the brain to cause hypovolemic shock. The point is they will on your test, they have a patient come in fixed and dilated and they're in shock. And your answer is look for other places like carpet, chest, abdomen, retroperitoneum, pelvis and thigh, okay? Because you recall that if you have a head injury, a brain injury, you don't get hypotension and tachycardia you get hypertension and bradycardia. And test question, what is that called? A Cushing's response, Cushing's response. Very, very good. All right, stick with me. When we talked about relatively straightforward hypovolemic shock, like from gunshot wounds to the belly, they're hypotensive, they're tachycardic, and their neck veins are flat. What happens if a patient comes to you and has gunshot wounds of their chest and abdomen, and they're hypotensive, they're tachycardic, but their neck veins are up to their ears? There are two diagnoses that can cause that scenario, meaning hypotension, tachycardia, and neck veins up to here. The first is called tension pneumothorax. Tension pneumothorax. What is a tension pneumothorax? Well, a tension pneumothorax is a pneumothorax, a complete collapse of the lung, where the injury causes a one-way valve, where the lung keeps getting bigger and bigger. Let me say this again. So one-way injury to the chest where air accumulates in the chest cavity and it keeps getting bigger and bigger 
and bigger. Now, in a regular simple pneumothorax, the maximum pressure in your chest is the outside world. But in a tension pneumothorax, the pressure inside the chest can be greater than atmospheric. And what happens? The mediastinum shifts away from the collapsed lung. And is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing because when the mediastinum shifts, it kinks the major blood vessels and that causes the blood pressure to go down. You get tachycardia and your neck veins are up to your ears. And in that scenario, very important, your heart can't fill. That's so important to say it again. Your heart can't fill. So how do you treat a tension pneumothorax? The way you treat a tension pneumothorax is by putting a needle into the second intercostal space. What you're doing is you're decompressing the tension pneumothorax and turning it in to a regular or simple pneumothorax. Do you need a chest tube? Oh, yes. But you put in the chest tube test question and life question after you decompress with the needle. Can I, meaning personally, put in a chest tube straight away for attention to a thorax? Yes, I can because of my experience. Can you for the test or life at your young age? No, because you must be what? Safe. Safe because immediately upon putting that needle in the second intercostal space, you create time where the patient is stable. Now you may ask me, why do you put the needle into the second intercostal space as opposed to putting the needle first where you are gonna put a chest tube on the side in the fifth intercostal space? I mean, why make two holes? Good question, right? The reason you put it in the second intercostal space is that in all people, all anatomy, whether you're muscular, not muscular, thin, heavy, whatever, man, woman, the distance between the skin and the pleura is that far. That's why it's very accessible. After you put the chest tube in, you take out the needle. Now there's another entity that can cause hypotension, tachycardia, and neck veins up to here. And that's called cardiac tamponade. And what that's caused by is you get an injury where blood accumulates into the pericardial space. Now in that situation, you might say, well, why do you get hypotension and tachycardia? The reason you get it is exactly the same as if you had a tension pneumothorax. The heart can't fill. The heart can contract fine, but it can't fill because of the fluid, the blood in the pericardial space. The treatment of a pericardial tamponade is called a pericardiocentesis. It's a little bit scary, but the first time you do it, you'll be a little bit anxious, but you'll get pretty good at it. You take a long needle, you go underneath the xiphoid and aim to the left shoulder. Now you don't shove in the needle real fast and hard because if you stick the needle all the way in and get in the left ventricle, that's not very good. You go very slowly and you're pulling back on the syringe 
as you go in, and as soon as you get blood, as you're pulling back the syringe, the patient's blood pressure is coming back to normal. And many times in the pericardial tamponade, all you need is that pericardiosentesis, meaning one time and the bleeding usually stops. Listen carefully, test question, life question. If after you do a pericardial tamponade, and the patient develops a recurrent pericardial tamponade, the treatment is called a pericardial window. A pericardial window. What that means is that you open up the chest, you do a thoracotomy, you cut a little window in the pericardium, so the blood will go into the chest cavity and you put in a chest tube. Let me repeat that. A pericardial window, you do a thoracotomy. You make a little window, a little hole in the pericardium and you put a chest tube in there. But you only do a pericardial window with a recurrent, a recurrent pericardial tamponade. So now I've told you two diagnoses that present exactly the same way. Hypotension, tachycardia, neck veins up to the ears. They both get that way because the heart can't fill, test question. So now I got a question for you. How do you differentiate in the emergency room between a tension in the thorax and a pericardial tamponade. Very simply, very simply. Breath sounds, meaning if you don't hear breath sounds, you put that needle in the second intercostal space. If you hear breath sounds, you do a pericardiosynthesis. And you have to make that diagnosis relatively rapidly because that patient can die within minutes while you're standing in the emergency room. So it's good old breath sounds with a good old stethoscope. All right? Very, very important. Very important. So now let's talk about another issue in trauma. We know that this is hypovolemic shock. But what if someone comes into the emergency room and they're hypotensive and they look like they're in shock, but they just had a heart attack? Is this hypovolemic shock, trauma shock? No, 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 no. This is called cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock is not hypovolemic shock. Cardiogenic shock is when someone had a heart attack and they end up in the emergency room because of that. And the treatment, of course, and you will get lectures on this, is dealing with a myocardial infarction. So that kind of shock, cardiogenic shock, is very different than hypovolemic shock. Well, there's a third type of shock, which you need to know about. Let me tell you the scenario. Someone gets penicillin when they're allergic to penicillin. Or someone gets stung by a whole bunch of bees. Or someone gets a spinal anesthetic and it goes too high in their spine. In those situations, the patient is hypotensive, tachycardia, but what will their cheeks look like? Normally in a hypotensive patient who's hypovolemic, 
their cheeks are pale. But in these patients, their cheeks are rosy. Why? Because this type of shock causes the sympathetic nervous system to shut off. And this is shock that we call vasomotor shock. And I want you to use that word, vasomotor shock, because it tells you exactly what the shock is. Vasomotor, disruption of the sympathetic nervous system. Yes, you can call that penicillin allergy an anaphylactic reaction, but it's vasomotor shock. You can call that bee sting a reaction, but it's vasomotor shock. You can call this high spinal a high spinal, but you call it vasomotor shock. The reason I say that is because when you call it vasomotor shock, everyone knows what you're talking about. And what is the treatment of vasomotor shock? The treatment of vasomotor shock is fluids, but you have to give pressors. So the treatment of vasomotor shock is both fluids and pressors. Fluids and pressors. If you don't give pressors, they will die because you have to get that sympathetic tone back in that patient. So remember, three types of shock. Hypovolemic, that's trauma. Cardiogenic, that's heart attack. And the third is vasomotor shock, either from an anaphylaxis or bee stings or a high spinal or a spinal injury.